Hello everyone, a bitch is back talking about books and today we are going to be talking about November 9. I got a comment I think a month or two ago back on my YouTube channel saying that I should read November 9 or do a review on November 9 and I said okay I'll put it on my list. I have been in a reading slump, I haven't really been able to pick up books and I know that no matter how good or bad a Colleen Hoover book is, she will get me out of freaking slump, okay? So I know I just read Reminders of Him not that long ago, but after reading that, I tried to pick up other books. I just couldn't do it. I just started reading it last night, and I finished it last night. My thoughts on this book are so all over the place. I hated it, and I loved it at the same time. Like, it was so messy to the point where I just couldn't stop watching. I gave this book a 2... 0.5 out of 5 stars just off of entertainment value alone like this book is insane to me and so toxic and obviously I will go through everything that I did not like about this book but oh my god when I said I thought ugly love was bad this is so much different and worse but also better in a way like it was so dramatic and I lived for the drama that I just I kind of like how messy it was like if you read it for entertainment value alone it's so fun to read. I was just like, what the heck? No way this man is real. My thoughts were so all over the place and there were just so many lines that I needed to point out. I had to make a Google Doc. If you guys have ever watched my YouTube channel, I'm very much a train of thought type of a YouTube channel. Like, it's very podcast-like in that way. There were way too many thoughts in my head. I had to make a Google Doc. So these are all my thoughts. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm just going to kind of go through the events of the book. So this will be spoiler review. Like, halfway through this video, it will be, it will start to get into spoilers because there's like a twist at the end. And let me just give a like small premise of what the book is about. So it basically follows this couple and their initial need meeting on the day of November 9th, which is a very significant day to the main girl because she got burned in a fire that night on November 9th when she was 16. It starts when the two main characters are 18, the first day that they meet each other and they kind of click. It follows their subsequent relationship every single year after that day. They meet on the exact same day of November 9th every single year at the exact same time without ever having contact with each other for the rest of the year. No phone calls, no nothing, like none of that. No emails. So I guess you could say it's very old school in that way, but they only meet once a year on this day so that this very tragic day that Fallon has gone through because that fire kind of ruined her career, ruined her life, etc. It could be instead of a day of a tr of remembering a tragedy, it can be a day that she looks forward to. It follows their relationship for every single November 9 for the next five years. It starts off on the first November 9, the day that they meet. It starts in a restaurant where Fallon and her dad. Fallon is the main girl. Fallon and her dad are sitting in LA in a diner having lunch. Fallon is an actress and because two years ago when she was 16, she's 18 now, at this time in the book, the fire ruined her acting career because she was an up-and-coming actress and she was gonna get big. And then, obviously, Hollywood really cares about looks, sadly. After the fire, her career kind of disappeared. Her love interest, Ben, eavesdrops on Fallon and her dad's conversation. Fallon is very insecure, so Fallon's dad is basically, like, talking down on her about how she should try to change her career options, that she can't really be an actress anymore. Fallon is telling her dad that she wants to move to New York. Fallon's dad is just being kind of like an asshole to her. Ben overhears this from the booth next door. Sorry, can you guys see that I'm in gum? I'm so sorry, I'm eating gum. Ben eavesdrop over the conversation and sits, includes himself in the conversation, slides into the booth next to Fallon, a complete stranger. Ben is a complete stranger. Puts an arm around Fallon and pretends to be her boyfriend so that he can like stand up to his dad because her dad says something like oh like you haven't been on a date with guys men don't find you attractive basically along those lines Ben tries to stick up to her getting super close to her kissing her hair and shit you are a complete stranger sir I do not know you this is not a meet cute that was the first red flag okay and there are many many after this he's cute you know like oh he's like a like boyish he's cute he looks a little messy etc and then he was a fine and dandy character, right? You look from him from afar, like they met, they caught eyes with each other when Fallon was going to the restroom, right? They look into each other's eyes, and then this boy opens his mouth. And the moment he opens his mouth, he is a red flag. Ben is a walking red flag, and Tate, I mean, Tate, I mean, Fallon eats that shit 
up. She eats it up. She loves all the red flags that she's seeing. Everything that came out of Ben's mouth was weird, creepy, sexualized Fallon. Even though, like, you know, Fallon is pretty insecure, she has, like, burns on her face, even though he's like, oh, it's not about looks, blah, blah, blah. He sexualized her the whole time. He says this about her. I seem to have a one-track mind. Her boobs, both of them. If we were just gonna sit here and stare at each other, it'd be nice if she were showing a little cleavage instead of wearing this long sleeve shirt that she leaves everything to the imagination. He's obsessed with what color underwear she's wearing and her boobs. Like, sir, you barely know her. And so it's really giving stalker vibes. Which doesn't sit well when you hear about the third eye conflict. Let me tell you. When you hear about the twist, let me tell you. The stalker vibes through the roof. And Fallon is a super, super insecure character. That's basically her entire personality trait. Ben knows this and points it out. And the way he does it is so nasty. He literally, this is word for word a quote. He says, I was so relieved because I could tell with one simple movement that you were really insecure. And I realized, since you obviously had no idea how fucking beautiful you were, that I just might have a chance with you. And so I smiled because I was hoping that if I played my cards right, I might get to find out exactly what kind of panties you were wearing under those jeans. He said, I was so relieved that you were really insecure because I might have a chance with you. He was really hoping for a girl to be insecure so that he can get her when she's vulnerable. Like, oh, she's in her vulnerable state. She's in a vulnerable state. Let me, this is my only chance. That's so gross. He's a writer. He's like a wannabe writer. He wants to be a writer. He's a smooth talker. All he does is smooth talk, you know? He just rambles on and you can definitely tell that this couple's love language is words of affirmation because that's all they do this entire book. None of their actions actually show that they actually love each other. He just goes on rants and rambles about how nice her boots are and how luscious her hair is, how soft her burned skin is, like it's so fucking weird. He's also really fucking controlling in the beginning and this is, mind you, this is within the first 50 pages. He's really controlling and consent is super super loose in November 9, so on the first November 9, um, they're gonna go out on a date later that night and Ben blatantly tells Fallon what she should wear. Oh, you should wear this. He wants her to wear this like revealing thing because she's insecure, right? She doesn't, she wants to like cover her burned skin or whatever. And he literally says, I'm paying for dinner so I get to choose what I stare at while I eat. Ew! Ew! That's so toxic and so gross. Like it's not even cute. Like that's so controlling. And it's really giving abusive behavior. The consent in this, like I was saying, is like not there at all. Fallon is really insecure, doesn't want to wear the revealing dress, and she starts crying. So not only is he telling her what to wear, she's crying about it, and as she's crying, she closes her eyes, and then Ben starts to undress her, and keeps pressuring her, taking off her clothes as she's crying. And mind you, they met like three hours ago, so this is a complete stranger. Like, you just, sir, you just felt comfortable doing this? He like strips her naked and says, wear this dress. Like, put your hands up so I can put this dress... Mm, I, I have no words. Anyway, Ben says, it's your own fault that people feel uncomfortable looking at you. I know what he's trying to say. If you come off as confident, then people will see that energy and etc, etc. But that was not the way to say it. Blaming her. First of all, for him, if you find out about the third act conflict, if you know where I'm going with this, for him to blame her, saying that it's her fault that people feel uncomfortable looking at you, out of all people, I don't think he has the right to say that, okay? And on top of that, these characters are racist because there was a line in this book where I was like, um, unnecessary, but okay. Like, what's their favorite food? He's like, oh, I like Pad Thai. And she's like, I like sushi. Then Fallon's like, oh, they're like, not the same at all. He says, they're almost the same thing because they're both Asian food. Okay, so I guess these characters are racist too? Like, what? Anyways, so all of these problems, this is like the tip of the iceberg. There is so many more things in here that like it's just so apparent about how insane this book is and like how toxic it is like I can't even explain put into words the audacity of this man Ben just had audacity this whole book is basically audacity but thank god the worst problems of this book happened in the first half okay Thank goodness. The second half isn't as bad, but it's just a bunch of angst and mischances and miscommunication. You know, 
new adult romance shit. New adult romance messiness, okay? It's like reading, I've never read After, but it's like watching the After series. Oh, they're just on again, off again. With every single fight that Fallon and Ben have, there's just so many re red flags. Ben physically stops Fallon from leaving a lot of time. Physically stops her. Kind of on the brink of abusive behavior. He takes her car keys one time after they, they have sex for the first time. <laughs> She tries to leave in a cab and he takes her car keys away at another fight that they have and he says, I never wanted to use physical force on a girl before, but I wanted to push her to the ground and hold her there until the cab drives away. Ew! Let's talk about the first time they have sex, okay? Because the first time they have sex, I don't know if I'm just missing it, if I'm really just reread this scene over and over again. I don't think they use protection. And they never mention it at all. Like, it's her first time, and there's some weird shit about virginity that I'm not gonna get into. He, like, undresses, etc, etc, and then he's just in her. Okay, I was literally screaming, this better at least at least lead to a pregnancy scare or there must be a, a discussion about this after because he just went in raw this man's just went in raw and they do not bring it up and it's like as if pregnancy doesn't even exist but that makes no sense because in this scene in the house that they are having sex in at that moment there are literally two pregnant women downstairs in the house they are having sex in there's two pregnant women, they know pregnancy exists, and they do not use protection, they don't even mention it. Okay, maybe this is gonna be a conflict for the next year. Maybe she's gonna come back with a baby, I don't know. Who the fuck knows, you know what I mean? I was like, okay, th this has to lead somewhere, they don't use protection, they don't even mention it. Next year happens, it's never brought up. I was like, did I just miss that? Did they use protection? Was there not even one line about like a crinkle of a wrapper? Like none of that shit, none of it, and I was like, Am I tripping? But they literally just did not use protection, I guess. And that really irked me. And then so they have sex, they have that fight. And Fallon, I hate her too. Don't think it's all just Ben. Ben is horrible, but I hate Fallon too. They're just both perfectly horrible people that are probably, because they're both so horrible, meant for each other. Like after they have sex that night, there's like a whole backstory about how two days ago, Ben's brother died in a car crash and leaves his fiance widowed. And pregnant like pregnant with their baby Fallon finds out a lot about like Ben's life etc etc about like this book he wants to write shit like that so basically the trope happens of Fallon saying I'm doing what's best for you so they have sex and he's like oh my god like I want to have a real relationship with you like let's stop this November 9 bullshit like I want your number give me your number give me your address etc etc like I want to be with you for real throughout the entire year and they have sex then Fallon basically takes back what she said and she's like oh actually let's just keep what wh what we're doing because it's better for your crew you can't have me as a distraction basically Fallon says and she's like I'm doing what's best for you shut the fuck up with that trope by the way yeah she leaves that November 9 it's basically her fault that they break up because he's so adamant about them being together and she's just like no we can't be together no like you help me so much with my confidence you need to have confidence in your writing like because you're a writer Ben and blah Blah, blah. I, I'm doing what's best for you. Shut the fuck up. Literally, shut the fuck up with that, with that trope. And then the next year happens, and then Fallon has the audacity to get butthurt that Ben moved on. She has the audacity to cry and weep and Ben moves on. But on top of that, it's even messier because Ben is also a bitch. Ben is also an asshole because the person that he moved on with was his dead brother's wife. <laughs> Mr. Steal Your Girl Part 2? And it's within the year his brother died. Ben gets with the wife or the fiance. I'm just going to call her the wife. And raises his dead brother's kid as his own within the year of his death mr steer girl like that's fucked up within itself within the year a little less than a year i don't think that that constitutes that time limit so they're both fucked up and then Fallon gets all butthurt that he moved on which she should does not have the right to do because she said she wanted to move on and then ben is the one who has to apologize to her what you're the one who broke up with him anyways it's just messy new adult shit. Then the next November 9, so this is like four years after they've met basically, Ben gets so much Tam Tam energy, like Tamlin energy from 
A Court of Thorns and Roses because Fallon's like, I can't do this. Like the 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 previous one, the one where he found out about Jordan aka the dead brother's wife and Ben getting together the year that she found that out she said I'm not meeting with you next year like I just can't do it anymore I'm sorry about your book first of all fuck the stupid book she's like I can't do it anymore like I love you too much like I, I'm not meeting with you next year and the next year happens right so she doesn't go to meet at their designated spot Ben still shows up hoping that she'll be there waits for her for four hours, then goes searching everywhere for Fallon. And then they meet at a bar. They meet up at a bar, basically, where he finds her and her friends, and Fallon's, like, with this other guy. He has such Tamlin energy, because the first thing that he really does is basically start making out with her and get physical with her, and he's like, oh, come home with me. Um, sir, you guys have a lot more things to talk about then the first thing you doing is getting physical that's such tamlin energy you know what i mean like the first thing you do you're in this little like time crutch and he's just like blah, 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 like making out with her and shit both fallon and ben are just horrible and honestly i don't even know fallon's personality besides the fact that she's insecure like that's literally her entire personality i know nothing else besides the fact that she likes sushi and she's an actress i guess and they have good banter ben and fallon have good banter but what's her favorite cut like literally nothing i know nothing about this woman it's so different than with emily henry and book lovers you know that both of them are very neat clean freak neat stuck up have that in the very beginning that like apparently fallon has like ocd behavior or tendencies but it never gets brought up ever again in the entire book i guess i guess ben and fallon they they call each other soulmates but it's they're soulmates purely off vibes alone it's just vibes like they have good vibes with each other and that's it we know nothing about these people in all honesty the other reason why i also hate fallon is because the only way that the plot can progress is by ruining her character even more and butchering her character even more by invading ben's personal privacy because what she does is that she invades his privacy by reading his manuscript and she like tries to justify it like, oh, Oh, it's about me, my blah, blah, blah. That's like reading someone's journal. You know how sensitive he was about his manuscript and no one reading it. And she still had the audacity to open up the book and read it. But it's good plot, you know what I mean? It's great plot. Because then this is when the twist happens, right? So after that whole bar thing happens and like, you know consent kind of being up in the air again and Ben kind of being controlling again they get back together and he's like they're gonna be together for real for real this time like they've been saying for every other november 9 for the past five years but whatever the plot twist happens and this book becomes a fucking nightmare it is so scary it is so much creepier than verity ever could be like i remember reading verity and being like oh kind of ominous no, this shit in this book is fucking scary, okay? This shit is way scarier than Verity could ever be because it makes all those times in Ben's inner monologue obsessing over Fallon's scars and like things about Fallon has such a different meaning because let me tell you the plot twist right now spoiler alert I already said that in the beginning but spoiler alert he's the reason that Fallon almost died he's the reason for Fallon's accident because apparently Fallon's dad and Ben's mom were like dating a little bit Ben has this whole backstory where his mom killed herself and then he like goes snooping and thinks that it's because of Fallon's dad goes to her house lights his car on fire actually ends up catching the whole house on fire and then that's how Fallon got her injuries so basically Ben's the reason why Fallon's life is ruined so the first year that they met the first November 9 Ben knew who Fallon was Ben knew that this was the girl that he ruined her life and I guess this entire book was some wicked twisted way to make himself not be depressed anymore because he was in a very depressive episode about ruining Fallon's life and he thought oh maybe if I help this girl become like happy and confident then it'll make him feel better I guess and make her feel better and not as guilty which by the way fuck you and secondly like the the fact that this couple actually ends up together at the end is such like what they actually end up together at the end because okay whatever he was grieving it was an accident maybe fallon can forgive him but they totally gloss over the fact that he lied to her for five years about 
about the fact that he was the one to cause the fire. Maybe she can forgive him for the actual fire happening because it was an accident and like he was grieving or whatever the fuck and he was like a stupid teenager. But how could, like, if I was Fallon, she is way too forgiving. She is way too fucking forgiving because I could never forgive someone for that. For, first of all, burning me or whatever. But whatever. You can forgive someone. I feel like that. I can suspend my disbelief for that. But the fact of the matter is that she forgave him for lying to her the whole time. And it, it really does put things in perspective because what he did is unforgivable in my eyes. Like, I do not care. He lied about it. It doesn't matter if you can forgive him for, like, the actual accident happening and it being an accident and her almost dying like it was a mistake. I don't know if you should get with a guy who fucking lied to you for five years and, like, being fucking weird about it. He was obsessed over her scars. He was like, oh, I want to see your burned boot. It's beautiful. I was like, ooh, I love this soft skin. Is it weird? I know that, that you probably, like, it's so weird for me to say this, but, like, I love how soft the burned skin is and, like, I'm kind of grateful for that fire. What? What? Literally what? So fucking gross. Like, so weird. It really puts everything that he said in the entire book into perspective. It doesn't matter that like, he claims that the only thing that he lied about was the actual fire. Putting everything into that perspective changes every single thing that you've said in the book. And it's really fucking weird and stalkerish and gross. It doesn't matter if he was angsty or not in his fucking manuscript or whatever. It doesn't matter what he went through and that he was grieving. He basically manipulated Fallon. The whole relationship was really based off of this one lie. Maybe you can forgive him for the actual fire. The fact that she actually forgave him and they got back together in the end is mind-boggling to me. Like, I really had to suspend my disbelief for that. There's this one line, when they break up halfway through the book, he says, Fallon doesn't realize that she was my passion the whole time. The book was just an excuse because he wanted to write a book about the relationship, whatever. It just makes so much more sense why he'd say that now. And it's just so like, oh my god, like, this book is really giving Joe from you vibes. It's really giving Verity. It's really fucking creepy. And I ate this shit up. I ate it up. I gave it a 2.5 stars. I think it's so fun to read. I think that if you want to read the messiest book that you have ever picked up in your entire life, this has great entertainment value, honestly. It is a great hate read. It is so, so, so fun. I hate that I really liked it for that reason. I hated the book, but I loved it at the same time. Because of it, my thoughts are so, so conflicting, and I cried. Yes, I cried throughout this whole book. I don't know what it was. Toxic new adult romance crap really really gets me in my feelings i hate the miscommunication trope but i love the longing that goes along with it the missed chances it just eats away at my heart and it makes me cry my eyes out and i cried i cried through this whole book that feeling of butterflies in my stomach when i read it oh i just couldn't stop reading this book i read it compulsively this was the fastest i think i've ever read a book in my entire life and i said that reading reminders of him last week within the day I read this within six hours. I am a very slow reader, mind you. It takes me a long time to get through a book, but this was so fast for me to read, I don't know how I did it. I really do not. But I read it within six to seven hours, and I'm very proud of myself for that. This book is like a car crash you cannot look away from. You cannot stop reading it. You can't, like a car crash, you can't stop watching. It's a horrible, it's a train wreck, but you can't look away. It was honestly so fun to read. I think it's a lot more fun to read November 9 than it is Ugly Love because this one was just so much more twisted. Uh, maybe people thought that the twist at the end was not that shocking. I was shocked, honestly. I was like, okay, that twist thoroughly got me. And that might be because the characters themselves weren't that really well written. That's why the twist shocked me so much. <laughs> I knew nothing about Ben's past and nothing about Fallon, Fire, or whatever. I was like, oh, I guess this is just a quirk of hers. But I think in, like, greater context, the twist would have been obvious. But if you just read this without really thinking about it, just go into it like a blank slate. No thoughts, head empty. And you have such a great time, honestly. That's what I felt. Don't read this like a romance. Honestly, I don't know what is with Colleen Hoover. Her books are very, very up and down for me. I'm just, I, they're, they are so all over the place. Some of them are horrible and some of them are not that bad. I don't know. I really don't know what to think about Colleen Hoover. This is what I say about her, about all her books that I realize. Don't ever read any of her books like a romance book. Don't ever read any of her books like a romance books. Read it like a train wreck. Read her books like a train wreck because 
I realize most of her books are marketed as romance, but they're just not romantic at all. They're not, and they're horrible. But anyways, th those are my thoughts on November 9. I have so much more thoughts, but please let me know yours if you've ever read this book in the comments below. Tell me if you've read it. This book, oof, I have, I would love to have conversations about this one. So thank you so much for watching. Whoever recommended me to read this, bless your heart. I had such a good time. I am so conflicted. Like, my mind is everywhere. I don't know what to think. Let me know your thoughts below. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Also, sorry if you could tell I was eating gum in this video and if it was distracting, but I don't care. Anyways, bye. Thank you so much.